My dad and I were on a boat in Michigan, paddling around a little lake, when he asked me, why are you going to Japan? You should look for journalism jobs here. I was a month away from leaving to become an English teacher. I told him I wanted to learn about the world. What kind of journalist would I be if I didn't? But after my two years there, I learned so much more, like how to peel a tangerine without the mess, how to become more generous, how to listen more patiently, and how to interact with people who have no idea what I'm saying. I started out as a writer, drifted into radio, and eventually realized you really don't need a degree to be any kind of journalist. So today, I thought I would share with you the lessons I learned along the way, which helped me to capture these images on film. So lesson one, allow yourself to be interviewed. It's a perfect way to figure out what's important to the people around you. So I worked at junior high schools and made one-day visits to elementary schools around Shizuoka City. I started each lesson with a self-introduction, followed by a question and answer. Back then, I had boy short hair. I am taller than many and too, be too big for most jeans and underwear, not to mention shoes. Some of my students thought I was a dude. Sometimes they'd ask, you know, just to make sure. The students would ask which I liked better, the mountains or the sea. We could see the nearby mountain ranges from the classrooms and Mount Fuji in the cold season when the air was dry. West of the city, the beaches were lined with strawberry greenhouses and piled with giant cement wave breakers. I couldn't choose, I told them. By the way, the first thing I learned about Shizuoka was that the area is where three tectonic plates converge and that it's overdue for a disastrous earthquake, potentially followed by disastrous tsunamis, and in a worst case scenario, followed by the eruption of nearby Mount Fuji. While the end was technically near, and I lost plenty of sleep over it at first, seriously, eventually I realized that the Japanese were not worried. Since childhood, they trained for this. My realization came long before a different earthquake um, devastated Fukushima many miles to the north. Anyway, the kids kept asking, and I decided I loved the mountains after I spent a month living in a mountain village surrounded by forests. I was the only foreigner around. Most of the men in the village worked in road construction and drank heavily at the restaurant owned by the parents of two of my students. The only other restaurant was a karaoke titty bar. <laughs> there was a man who made bento from cypress wood by hand. His work is a treasure known to make the rice in your lunch taste more delicious. He completed five or six lunch boxes every day, cutting and soaking the wood to make it pliable. He coiled and dried it, threaded it with cherry bark, and painted and covered it with lacquer. He worked at the top of a hill, helped only by his mother. The school groundskeeper taught school kids how to gather maitake mushrooms from under wooden logs. Like many others in the village, he harvested food like chestnuts and kept a garden. He also hunted and kept bees. And for my going away dinner, he killed and cooked a black bear and a deer. Which brings me to one of the most important lessons ever for, let's admit it, getting intimate. Eat the food. I fell for a man named Hideki who worked in his family restaurant. I'd sit down at the counter and tell him to feed me. Chicken wings were grilled on skewers and dipped in a pungent garlic sauce. A firm jelly made from a root called konyaku was smothered with tar-like miso. And now and then I'd get the quartered pig's feet. All that collagen is good for your skin, he would tell me. In his late 30s, he looked like a boy. He must have been eating a sow a day. I became part of Hideki's routine. Over dinner with him and his friend who owned a gourmet restaurant, I learned about seasonal delicacies and the ways to cut fish and grind wasabi root. Late at night after work at another friend's pub, Hideki talked about spending his one free morning each week fishing with friends on the lakes around Mount Fuji. Which brings me to lesson three, immerse yourself in the lives of others. It's the only way you can really try to understand other people. 
After a few months of living in Japan, then a year, and then some, I got comfortable. I learned some Japanese, and people made an effort to understand me when I made an effort to become understood. For breakfast, I walked down the street and sat at her counter. Coffee with milk, toast with butter, some salad, an egg, and ham. She and I talked about sports, her kids and grandkids. I told her where I was headed that weekend, up north on the train to a museum with a friend, or to fix my bike. Take care, she'd say, and would repeat the next time I didn't feel like cooking. Yuna and I love to spend our nights out dancing. She loves hip hop, I love hip hop. She is a photographer who brought, bought me a film camera with a beautifully distorted lens and encouraged me to take time exclusively for shooting. Her English is so good that when she actually spoke Japanese, I felt the urge to say, Yuna, your Japanese is amazing. <laughs> At school, middle-aged teachers felt it was their duty to educate me about the heritage and customs of Japan, while young, unmarried male co-workers were skittish and avoided even eye contact with me. But at mandatory all-you-can-drink office parties, they all got drunk and chatty and cheered bonsai and red in the face like boiled beets. <laughs> then one morning, a colleague who sat on my right killed himself while taking a bath. He was in his early 40s and taught English. I heard about incidents mostly involving trains. Eventually, every time I stood on a platform, I'd look away as trains approached, in case anyone decided to jump. Which brings me to the last lesson. You'll never really understand everything. At the first school where I worked, I worked with Yamauchi Sensei. I was his daughter's age. He let me borrow a stack of English guides to Japan. In return, I constantly kept showing up at his desk, trying to understand how Japan works and asking why. For Christmas, he gave me a strawberry plant, and he quietly placed an orange on my desk after he saw me crying one morning. He took me to his favorite restaurants and showed me his favorite views of Shizuoka. Two years later, over our final dinner together, he was still my political and cultural encyclopedia, though the only thing I really understood was that he was my Japanese dad.